Welcome back to this series on the OWASP Top 10 Explained and we're up to um, Top 10 uh, issue number 4, A4 and just so that you know this is from the 2013 list there is a new list coming out soon um, and I'm sure this will still be in the top 10 anyway and it's called Insecure Direct Object References and that sounds quite confusing but actually is is a very simple vulnerability to understand and also very simple to fix although it's also quite common to see it. So what is it in a nutshell? Well when usually we're talking about a URL but it's not exclusively a URL. But when it contains some reference to an object uh, in the database, for instance, then if the permissions are not correctly set up on that site, on that application, then someone can change this value here in the query string and potentially access data that they should not. Now, I guess I need to say right up front that this is a very simplified definition. So the vulnerability does not just exist in a query string. It can exist in a posted form. It could exist in the data typed in into a box. If you're say doing a search uh, for something, then the same basic vulnerability exists, but the concept itself is the same. Um, and we're gonna have a quick look at what that's like. So if we bring up, this is my trusty Ye2 application uh, that I use for teaching the basics of Ye2. And what I've done is I've set up a system that's basically a very uh, poor quality example of a book ordering system. So we have a link here which lists books, we have a link which lists authors, that kind of stuff, and we can kind of view books and stuff like that. Now, at the minute, this uh, site, this application doesn't have any particular authorization. So you might notice that I'm not actually logged in yet, but I can still kind of view all of these things. So obviously that's a problem. If we're talking about a secure web application, we would expect to have to log in before we can access these things. So the first thing I'm gonna do in my Yi application is I'm just gonna bring in a filter on the, in this case, just for um, everything inside the book controller. So everything now is gonna require that I am logged in. Uh, and in E2, in PHP, that is signified by an at symbol. Your framework, it will be completely different, possibly or probably. So don't worry too much about the details of this, but hopefully you'll get the idea of what it is that I'm doing. So if we go back to our application now, uh, if I try and click on authors, that's fine because I haven't changed authors. But if I try and click on books, it's going to tell me that I'm not allowed. Now, obviously, in real life, we wouldn't put up a horrible message like this 403 error, which the user is not going to really understand. Um, certainly not for something that has a menu item that's visible. It would be different, perhaps, if this item was hidden when the user isn't logged in, but I haven't bothered doing that for now. All I've done is I've blocked access to it and it says login is required, so that's fine. I'm gonna now log in as one of my users that I've set up, and when I log in, I'm now able to access the books menu. So that's fine, that's just kind of normal stuff, nothing to do with the topic that we're talking about. But let's first look at what a direct object reference is and why it is a direct object reference. So in the Yi2 data grid, you'll see here at the end, there's some icons just around here. And uh, that one is the view icon. And if you click on the view icon, you'll notice that in the URL, we have this little bad boy in the query string, ID equals two. And pretty much every website you'll ever go on or any application of any kind of complexity, is almost certainly going to have these on the, the query string. I mean, even PHP, my admin, you'll see here there's actually a fragment on the ends, but then here you'll notice that even things like PHP, my admin, DB equals that, table equals that, server equals that, all the rest of it. So that's all pretty kind of normal, common stuff. But herein lies the problem. So let's go back to our books for a second. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that a certain user is not allowed to view this book. 
Now in real life, in your framework, you would have an authorization mechanism to do this. So you would have to have some way in your database of knowing which items in the database should or shouldn't be accessible to, to whatever user. But because I don't have any of that set up, I'm going to just cheat a little bit. And at the end of my book controller, this is the method that looks for a specific ID in the case of the book. And all I'm going to do here by uncommenting this is very, very simply say that if I am a user ID four and I want to get book number two, uh, then that's going to be blocked. So that's not going to let me do that. Hang on a second. Sorry, I've just missed a step out. Let's go. Let's go back one step. Um, at the minute, this uh, book list is effectively generated with an active query. So ignoring the fact that this is actually a search box, which allows you to do things like clicking stuff in here and clicking the rank or the rest of it. Ignoring that bit at the minute, it just finds all of the books and it does nothing with the permissions. So first off, I'm just going to change this to show what is usually the protection mechanism that people use in order to protect items from a user who shouldn't have access to it. So. All I've done here, again, very, very quick and dirty, is I've just said, as long as the book is not ID number two, which is this top one, Paradise Lost, if it's not that, then return everything else in the list. And now that I've uh, uncommented that, if I go back here and refresh the page, surprise, surprise, book number two is now hidden away. So this is what we would call, um, I don't know, security by obscurity i guess it's uh, a phrase that's used quite often and what it's basically saying is i'm going to gain security from my application by hiding things from a user who shouldn't see them so in this case if i'm logged in as luke then you'll notice i can't see that um, book so what happens now is i can still click on these other links and they're going to work fine but you've probably already realized that the problem that we have here is what happens if I click on this? And I, so I now see the URL and I know what the URL looks like. But now what happens if I change that number to a number that is not in my list of books? Well, unsurprisingly, I get access to it. And I get access because this here is what we would call an object reference. It's an object reference because it matches a particular column in the database, in this case, the ID column. So two is Paradise Lost. That's the book we're trying to hide. Now, what are we going to do with this? We have to have some kind of reference on this URL. Otherwise, the system itself, the application, is not going to know which book to view. So again, you might have already realized that what we need to do is we need to check for a, a permission uh, for this user to access this specific book or item, whatever the item is, we need to check that before we show the book to the user. So we've kind of only done half a job here. And as you might imagine, although this is a quite a poor example, there was a real life case of uh, a company called Hotel Hippo who did something similar. But instead of a book, this was an invoice. Uh, an invoice with details like addresses and holiday booking information, all the rest of it. And they had done exactly this. They had hidden it from view, but they hadn't hidden it from somebody doing this by changing the number manually and being able to see somebody else's invoice with somebody else's address. So that's really the weakness. That's the problem or the, the threat of an insecure direct object reference. So because it's that kind of simple to understand, you might not be surprised to find out this also very simple to fix. So this was the bit I apologize that I jumped the gun, kind of went straight to this. So all I'm doing here is, again, you would actually do this in a much more general way. I've hard coded a user ID um, and the ID of the book. But in real life, we, again, you'd have to ask your framework to say, does this user have permission to view this book? And the logic behind that might be anything. It might be the owner of the book. It might be the person who added the book. It might be somebody who's, you know, friends with somebody who owns the book. Whatever that logic is, you need to ask that at the relevant point. 
and uh, then do the check. And if the check fails, we throw an error. So what happens now, if I go back to books, this is the same. If I click on one of these, it's the same. But now what happens if I try and change that to two? Sorry, did I not save this? Oh, I'm logged in as the wrong user. So that's fine. Um, so it's allowing me to use the Luke user. But if I log out Luke and log in as Luke2, and now I go on here, I've still hidden the book, so that's a bit kind of confusing. But so now if I try and change that to two, what it's done in the code is it's very specifically said if this is Luke2 and they're trying to access book number two, then they're not allowed to, and you throw a forbidden. Uh, and what forbidden basically means is there's no point logging in. I know who you are, but you still can't access this item. So that's what 403 error is. And the thing with this is it's going to appear on probably almost all of these actions in your controllers, in your web pages, whatever framework it is you're using. At every level, you need to be thinking, does the person need to be authenticated, i.e. are they going to have something like this? And even if they are authenticated, do they have specific permission to access this item? And because it is something that you'll see on lots of different uh, in lots of different places, it's the kind of thing you really need to put into a code review checklist, the sort of checklist that you use every time you check in new code into Git or Subversion or whatever you're using, that you actually ask the question of your new code. Have I checked that this app, that the user calling this action has permission to do whatever it is that they're attempting to do? So that is that. Let me try and resume the slideshow. So how common is it? Well, missing out access control, sadly, is still very common. Um, and I guess part of the problem is that it's very difficult for a framework to require auth authorization on every single action that gets carried out because the framework doesn't know whether this is an open application, whether it's a closed application, whether it's partially open, partially closed. So the framework can't really know whether the thing should be locked down. And that's why, like I say, you need to have something like a code review checklist to be able to make sure that you're checking these things as you're going along. And if you make any major changes to a particular piece of code, then you need to test it again. And you need to be very um, kind of automated about that, very ruthless with your testing, because of course it only takes one place to make a mistake and you can cause you know a real big problem. And in the case of Hotel Hippo, uh, I believe that actually went out of business as a result of um, the kind of embarrassment from this vulnerability. So it is something that you need to be very careful about, but at the same time, it's very easy. The other thing that you need to be aware of is it's also very easy for an attacker to exploit it. I mean, how hard is it for an attacker to change a number here and say, well, you know, am I going to get anything useful if I change this number? Well, that's a not found. Great. That's useful information. Thank you. What about that? No. What about this? Oh, bingo. I've, I found my way into something. So it's very, very easy for an attacker. And that's why it's really important that you uh, block those with authorization calls. Um, so that is that is like I say, very easy to test whether your application is vulnerable because it only takes two seconds to look into your code. And to be honest, if you haven't put anything in your code, I mean, if you're looking at something like this, quite obviously you have no protection. Uh, if you look at your code and then you find these kind of things, you know, forbidden exceptions, whatever, maybe you've got something in there. But then you need to ask, is the logic correct? Have I got it in every action? Uh, or is it in the, the, the correct place? Have I tested all these to make sure? Because um, so, sometimes, even if we try hard, we there might be something in the framework that is either broken or does something that we don't expect. And when it does that, we then say, well, I put in some code and it doesn't work. So we, we can't just put in code and hope that it works. We need to test all of these different things. Um, so that's how common it is. So we've already talked about this. Everywhere that an object reference is used, 
permission must be checked for the current user before returning the item to the user. Now, obviously, if in your application is a public application and it's something like Amazon, where you can everyone can just search for stuff, then it might not be relevant, but you still need to ask the question as you write your code as to whether the thing needs to be locked down with an authorization check. Another thing that you might not necessarily think much about, I think it's covered in, whoops, sorry, one of the other OWASP um, top 10 items, is to log things. So when somebody tries to access an item that they shouldn't, then why not log it? Log it to a file, log it to an email, and that might tell you a number of things. It might tell you if a particular user is abusing your system, in which case you might decide to block their account. It might show you that you've made a mistake on a page and maybe you've linked an item that, should be, uh, that shouldn't be linked on a page and it might just be a simple coding error. But with that logging, you get to see that and ask the question, why is it that everybody keeps trying to access this item? So monitoring and logging is really important. There is one other method that OWASP uh, suggests uh, it's kind of complex really and I'm not sure there's necessarily a, a great deal of, of extra security by doing it but what they suggest doing as another option is to effectively randomize and anonymize the subject IDs so what they would do is they would say well if I'm Luke 2 and I try to access ID 4 then the ID 4 will be mapped onto a different ID in the database. So the only IDs that will be allowed for me to type in, you know, might be numbers one to 10, and they map onto 10 different IDs in the database. And then if Luke one or Brian or John or whoever else logs in, their numbers one to 10 will map onto 10 different books. So then theoretically, there's no physical way for me to change this to something that I can't see because the only numbers that make logical sense are these numbers that map my user onto my permitted books. The reason I don't really think it adds any security is at the end of the day, that is both a permission check which you've already done anyway, um, because that's where, um, that's the example I showed. But the other thing is you then have to manage that system. And on a large application, that's a lot of memory that you're gonna be taking up, uh, potentially mapping lots of different user IDs onto object IDs. So don't, although it sounds like a nice idea, I personally, I don't really think it has any additional value. If you check permission, then it's gonna work anyway. And if the user tries to access the wrong thing, then they're not going to be allowed to they're not going to be allowed to do that anyway. Um, there might be some uses for this other system. Personally, uh, I've never used it. I can't really see where you would use it, but I'm not going to say that it's um, that it's definitely um, never that it's definitely never going to have any use. So that's kind of it really on the direct object references. So hopefully it's fairly obvious what's going on here. This thing is the vulnerability because it's very easy to do that and change it. And if you're not going to check the permission of this request against the logged in user, then you've got the chance to expose data and that could be personal data, it could be health information, it could be information about trade union membership or sexuality or you know anything that's considered super personal could all be exposed by having this vulnerability but the good thing is it's very easy to fix you need an authorization system you need a way of mapping permissions onto objects for each user and then you need to make sure that you are enforcing it so that's all there is to say really about a4 owasp top 10 if you've got any questions or comments please add them below Otherwise, I shall see you again hopefully soon for A5, which is a security misconfiguration. Okay, thanks.